Thank you everyone for joining. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's ILEA webinar. My name is Gwendolyn McNutt, CSCP, and I'm the chair of the ILEA Professional Development Committee. Today we'll be presenting Making Virtual Engagements Engagement Meaningful, powered by Giants Enterprises. Thank you, Giants Enterprises, for your continued support. We hope that you take away some new ideas, fresh perspectives, and strategies to apply to your own businesses and careers from today's presentation. And I just have a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. We will be recording today's session, and it will be posted on the ILEA Hub. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A, and we'll try to get to some of them at the end of the discussion. Please share your thoughts and comments in the chat and share your experience on social media using the hashtags ILEA Webinar Wednesday and ILEA Welcomes All. And finally, don't forget that ILEA is accepting submissions for the 2021 ILEA Esprit Awards. The 2021 ILEA Esprit Awards are open to our entire events community and submissions are due on Monday, March 31st. Submit your entries at www.ileahub.com slash Esprit Awards. Today's webinar is being led by Carol Aldering, Aldering CMP DES, and Ryan Hansen, CED, CSCP, and DES. Carol started her career as a paralegal specializing in domestic and real estate law. She was recruited to be the first event planner for Ex Experience Columbus, where she spent 32 years as director of events. During that time, she added certifications as a CMP and a DES to her list of qualifications. She currently serves on numerous boards, including the American Red Cross, Columbus Zoo, and is an active member of the ILEA Professional Development Committee. Ryan believes that the act of gathering can and should change the world. So much, in fact, that in 2008, he founded Be Events, a creative agency dedicated to designing experiences that people love. Today, he leads a team in defining what will delight and pushing creative boundaries to deliver remarkable events for individuals, brands, and nonprofit organizations. He has been recognized for over three with over three dozen regional and international awards. As an industry thought leader, his ideas and commentaries have graced numerous glossy pages, and he is a frequent speaker for the industry on event strategy, design, and engagement. Ryan is a current member of the ILEA Board of Governors, and in 2009, he received the ILEA Volunteer of the Year Award. In 2010, he earned his Certified Special Event Professional designation, and in 2020, he added the Digital Event Strategist and Certified Event Designer credentials. Please welcome Carol and Ryan. Welcome. Ryan and I are delighted to be here today to talk about meaningful engagement during virtual events. We want to identify what we've been missing, what virtual events take advantage of, and some possible solution and tips for you. We've brought a special guest along today who Brian will introduce and chat with a little later. This is meant to be interactive and fun. We want your participation. So please respond to our questions in the chat box and remember to place your questions for us and our guest speaker in the question and answer section. Now we wanna get started. Ryan, kick us off. Thanks, Carol. Absolutely, completely delighted to be here to start talking about engagement, which is such a passion for myself uh, in any event that we get to do, live, digital, or hybrid. You know, and it was really funny as we were preparing for this presentation today uh, and working on sort of the, the photography that you're going to get to see uh, to accent our slides. You know, every time I turned the corner, it was as though it was a picture of people drinking while they were um, on a virtual meeting, whether that was beer or coffee or even wine, it seemed like the only thing that you needed to be happy online was a drink in your hand. Um, we must be missing something else. Brian's right. So what have we been missing? Do me a favor, close your eyes. I promise I won't sneak in any pictures of beverages while you're doing that. Remember the last session or conference you went to 
seeing the creative stage, how the room was decorated, hearing music, shaking hands or hugging a friend, smelling coffee in the back of the room or grabbing a snack in the hallway. All five of your senses were engaged and immersed you into the event. Remember? Okay, now open your eyes, go in the chat box and briefly list a challenge that you have engaging your audience during virtual events. I'd be willing to bet one of your challenges involved the senses that I just mentioned. Of course it does. So now let's talk about, don't go into the chat box, make your set, I'm gonna go on. Okay, while planning your virtual, virtual events, we know you're considering interaction. You're, but are you thinking about attendee to attendee or the attendee interaction with their environment? We can't take them out of the environment they're in. We know we're, that they're looking at a screen and they're probably alone, but we have to do our very best to engage them in a different environment while they're attending the virtual event. Immersion. Currently, we've all tried breakout rooms, chats, question and answers, raise your hand, but have we suggested or done a fun activity unique to their interest or our content? All events have unique audiences, but is your engagement activity being creative and unique? They need inspiration. We have music breaks, Zoom happy hours, but are we coming up with new ideas for gaming or fun? Are you still counting those beverages in the slides? Could they be counting a corporate logo in your presentation or seeing the CEO's picture hidden in slides during a presentation? Are you being creative with your inspiration to get them involved? Ryan, what are some of the challenges you saw? Yeah, thanks guys for, for adding some thoughts to the chat. Um, Elaine said Zoom fatigue and attention span is really driving her crazy in virtual meetings. Uh, David mentioned live music, how probably misses that. Uh, Brian seconded that, that he was missing live music as well. Um, and Ashley shared something that you uh, referenced quite well, which was that true lack of attention or lack of connection uh, between attendees. You know, you know, let's not be afraid. I mean, virtual is not all bad news, guys. Virtual events are fantastic at sort of content distribution. I mean, that's what they're really meant to do. Uh, they're also good for training and for instruction. And, you know, if you put some effort in and have some expense, you can distribute that information in a pretty immersive environment in 3D. You know, uh, you can let all your attendees be avatars and have them interacting with each other in digital, in sort of a digital or virtual world. But, you know, environment alone is not a substitute for engagement. No matter how captivating it might be uh, or it might invite you to participate, the return is probably pretty short lived because it's separate and filtered and distribution of content, well, that's just passive. It's like watching television. You know, you can send as much information out as you want, but that's not participatory uh, conversation. Engagement really requires dialogue uh, and it necessitates sort of a feedback loop, you know? So technology does offer some great tools for content distribution and has great potential to be a democratized venue uh, where people can engage, but creativity, collaboration, and community building, those are human endeavors. It doesn't just happen. We have to, uh, with intention and with design, manufacture the social moments that we all took for granted when we were in person with each other. To that comment about Zoom fatigue, it's not weird that the, at the end of a day long conference, you feel exhausted. You know, about 70% of the information that we take in as people when we interact with each other comes from nonverbal cues. Well, over, the, over a Zoom call like this, you don't get to see what my hands are doing. You don't get to pick up on those sort of on, the, on sort of the body language pieces that our brains who have evolved over hundreds of thousands and millions of years are looking for. So we end up with pent up energy that we don't know how to spend and pure exhaustion when we're done. You know, doesn't that seem sad? What is a planner producer to do? Well, one thing that we do know is that attention spans are short uh, and in any virtual presentation, it's good to change things up. Uh, so as Carol mentioned, we've invited a guest speaker to join us today to help us sort of understand what meaningful engagement in a virtual event can look like. I'm sort of very excited to bring up Sam Smith, uh, 
uh, we met over a little, a little over a decade ago in the early days of hashtag event prof on Twitter. Uh, back then he was experimenting with hybrid events and uh, engagement strategies for live events. Uh, and we had, we've had the pleasure of partnering together on several projects. And when it comes to the topic of engagement, there is no one I have ever met that is wiser or more passionate on the topic. So I, when given the opportunity to have him share some thoughts, I had to let him in. So welcome, Sam. This is great. I'm going to try to stop sharing, to stop sharing my screen for a second here uh, so we can see each other. Hey, Ryan, how are you? I'm doing great, man. Thank you. So how about if we open up with if you could share a little bit about um, yourself. With, with yeah, so, so just for everyone on the call who might not know who I am, um, I've probably, in the last year, we've done over a thousand virtual events. Um, but what's probably more important than that is that um, I've been in the events industry for about 15 years and have been working on audience engagement most of that time um, in a lot of different ways. Um, and probably, 10 years ago, I did my first hybrid event, right? That's a new, that's going to be something that's coming on new. And, um, and we, and we did several between probably 2010 and 2018. We did a lot of different types of them, but at the time, and, I, and we can get into details later, but the other, the other thing I would say, in, in addition to that is that, so, so lots of virtual events. Now we've done hybrid events, been doing them for a long time. And then the last thing I would say is that I know this is ILEA, but my in a different life, I did lead the research projects for MPI to create all of the how-to guides and research for hybrid events and virtual events. Um, and th that was several years ago, but there's a lot of principles that still apply today. So I have a lot of background and things I can kind of offer you guys that hopefully will send you out of this webinar with um, some new ideas or at least some thoughts on things to consider as you go forward. That's awesome, Sam, and so glad you could join us. You're able to join us today. So, uh, hey, to kick it off, you know, in your opinion, how would you define meaningful engagement? Yeah, so our philosophy on engagement is aligning it to the content, right? So that, that's probably the first thing. So I hear a lot of people, and we do game. We do, and just so everybody knows, I do lots and lots of games. We do lots of games. Um, but we hear a lot of people like, hey, they clipped the agenda. Give them five points or they, whatever, they did something in the platform. That's not meaningful engagement to me. What meaningful engagement to me is, is reinforcing the learning objectives of the workshop or reinforcing the content or setting behavior that will drive them to, um, to, to perform better in life, right? So we work with a lot of sales meetings, right? And they wanna improve do you know the product? Do you have better sales skills? Do you know, understand the markets, right? And so the, all of the behaviors around that, you can create incentives and engagement to try to reinforce all those messages. And that's, that's what I think is the most important thing to have successful engagement. So that's probably the one, the one thing. I know you're gonna ask me a, nec a next question, which is what are the top three? But the second thing you've already mentioned is, is I think is the feedback loop. And I wanna say this because you demonstrated the feedback loop. So when you, whenever you, uh, an example of a feedback loop is, hey, will you put in the chat some kind of content, right? And, and they asked you to do that earlier. And then this, the feedback loop though, is when Ryan started to say, Stephanie said this, Marcus said that, Ryan, you know, Dave said this. There's a couple things that happen when you do that. The first thing is that there's a guy, there's probably someone here from Iowa or whatever. And they're like, Yes, he said my name. Yes. yes. <laughs> and they're doing like a private dance and excited. But there's also some other people out there that are like, I said live music. Why didn't he say my name? That was my example too, right? And those things are important because what happens to your attendees is some of you that might have felt like, hey, why didn't he say my name? We then find, and our data shows this, that they'll put more comments in because they're waiting for, when was he going to say my name? When's my name coming up? Right. So that's something the, impor the be important part of the feedback loop, because as an organizer, it doesn't take a lot of effort to just do that. But it has a lot of meaning for the attendees because it helps them refocus on the content rather than doing what you're doing now, which is listening to me just ramble on. Right. Well, and speaking of a feedback loop, we just got a great comment from an event planner that says your lampshade is crooked in the background. So 
<laughs> that gives you a great chance to change that while you're thinking about, well, we switch to the next question if you want, if you want to straighten that lampshade out. Yeah, I can, I can do that. But it's actually part of my plan was to put this lampshade in here because it's really bad, right? Like you want to have your speakers not do this. And so that's, that's an example. And, and, and also to that point, it's also like some things you want to think about, right? Sound and lighting. Sound's probably the most important, but even if I turn off the, the light, right? I have a front facing light, or if I were to turn off like a side facing light, well, that one doesn't really have an effect, but like if I turn off this light, these things, it changes the room. And I think you want to have your speakers, if they're mostly going to look at their face, right? If that's what we're going to be focused on, make sure you give them some advice on lighting. There's lots of strategies for that. I have just some lame Home Depot lights, but nobody knows that. So anyway. Cool. So along with sort of setting setting the right sort of tone for that speaker on camera, what, um, in your experience, where do you see planners and producers struggling right now when it comes to engagement with their audiences? What are they what are they missing or getting wrong? Yeah, so, so let's talk about format, right? So I think that's probably the biggest thing. A lot of people are thinking about, well, I, I did this in my live event. We had a 60 minute session and then we had a 15 minute break and then we had a 45 minute breakout or whatever. So that's a long time to focus on a little three by five window when you're one click away from doing anything else on the internet, right? There's, there's now, there's, there's TikTok videos to watch, right? There's all kinds of anything else to do, but listen to, listen to people talk forever and look at their head. So, but what I would, I would say to everyone is to kind of use your analogy of like either to Netflix or to live TV. So if you watch sports or like an Oprah type show or um, or even or even we just got done with the the election all those news programs they're changing the camera angles all the time right they're changing the camera and moving those really fast even if you go on uh, on YouTube and watch like Mark Rober he's the science guy that my kids like to watch and we watch these videos all the time or um, John Krasinski right when he did some groups you know some good news those kinds of videos they're changing the camera all the time and so as that content moves, that's much more engaging to someone than if they just sit there and watch one video. And in fact, the statistics used to say that it needed to be every um, one minute, right? If you didn't change the camera angle or change the screen every one minute, um, that people would start to lose interest. And that's probably reduced now. I don't know what the updated numbers are, but I'm sure it's reduced quite a bit, with, especially with TikTok, because you know, we're all TikToking. So uh, along with that, so like you just said, it's that change, change up your content every minute. I, you know, I've, I've heard even 30 seconds. Uh, you want to be flipping a slide uh, and one idea to a slide and thinking about it also, you know, to that point, you know, some people are logged in here on a phone. That's really, really small. And if you think about back in live events, you did PowerPoint slides that had all of this detail and all of this like text on them. You can't see that on your phone, right? So yeah, you know, that needs well, sort of make more captivating content or simpler content. But that's also a case for what's most important, right? So the video I just showed you some camera stuff, but it's your audio that's probably the most important because if I'm on my phone, I'm probably out on a walk, I'm driving, I'm doing anything else. Um, so the audio becomes the dominant thing to be, to be great at, right? Be great at the audio because they're not going to watch the slides. They're not going to look at the other stuff. Do you have any uh, benchmarks you could share with our guests today about uh, or about how to try to set expectation for measuring good participation in their virtual events? Yeah, so, so we, do, um, we do a lot of games, right? And what I can tell you is that if you can redefine how you present content, um, you, so, all right, so, so people will do chat, that's fine. <clears throat> but if you're not aligning the chat and giving people prompts, so a lot of these chat things people have, they're like, hey, just chat about what? What do people chat, chat about? And they complain, they do whatever, but there's not a prompt, there's not a focus, right? So if you can give them a focused prompt, talk about this, right. they'll talk about that. And you'll get, you'll get some good feedback from that. And it depends on the prompt. What we found is if you ask people, you're gonna get a lot more responses. Like if you ask the question, what did you wanna be when you grow up? Then what do you think about such and such executives yeah. comment, right? People are afraid to say what they think about executives comment or the new strategy whatever if they can do it privately not in the public chat they'll give you lots and lots of comments but if it's public you give a few but what we what we've seen over this 10 years is that if you do a game the the participate a trivia game just a little trivia game a quiz doesn't matter doesn't matter what you do 
they will play. They will play and they'll play a ton. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that feedback loop because they see, did I get it correct or not? And two, there's usually a leaderboard and that's public recognition. So something you want to offer. So a leaderboard is really public recognition. My name, big and lights. Yes, and I'm ahead of Steve or I'm ahead of Ryan. And that's all that really matters. I may not be winning, but I'm beating Ryan and that's all that matters. Those little things drive engagement. And the reason for that is that we have a lot of excess capacity. And you guys said this, there's all this excess capacity. We're one click away from doing anything and listening doesn't take a lot of resources. And when you put a game out there and if you line it to the content, we just, the numbers are through the roof. We just, um, whether, and it's all kinds of people. It doesn't matter if they're accountants or pharmaceutical people or association, whatever, or special events for holiday. I don't know, whatever it is, St. Patrick's Day, they'll, they'll go crazy and your numbers are really high. And then that is what drives, or that's you know, executives love all that. So if you're looking for numbers, those kinds of things will drive your numbers. Now, does that drive outcomes for your event? And the answer to that is, in my opinion, not necessarily. That if you want to drive the outcomes from your event, you have to align it to the content. So cool to have games, cool to have prompts, cool to have whatever, but if you don't align it to the content and align it to the objectives, it's just a thing. Awesome. You know, one of the reasons I was most excited to have you join us today is because, you know, 2020, everybody's tired of hearing it, but it was a pivot to digital. 2021 is going to be the pivot to hybrid. And I know you've had 10 years of playing in the hybrid space uh, where, where many people have not. And I know that one of the things I, I often in dialogue or conversation with clients on is the fact that, you know, hybrid is not just putting a camera up in the back of the room and broadcasting your live event, right? Uh, this is about designing for audiences. And you have two very distinct audiences, an audience in the room and an audience that's online. How do you, as a planner or producer, keep that, you know, think about engagement when the audience is split like that, when they're live and remote? Yeah, so, so here's my recommendation. So remember in your live events, right? And we haven't done these in a year, um, that you're gonna start to have breaks, right? You've got the break when people are moving from room to room, right? That morning break, and you've got a lunch break or whatever you're gonna do. Maybe you're gonna send them into the trade show. Um, what do you do with the online people at that time, right? How do you keep them connected? And, and I see that as, as a big a big thing for you to think about. What are you gonna do? And that's like where we might've thrown up a game and said, here, while you're out, while everyone's at, at a snack, you can get your bologna sandwich, whatever you want. So let's put up a game. And then that's something that people might play um, where they could be playing it in a booth or out in the trade show floor, right? In a physical event, you would have that same game on a trade show floor. So what we found is that the people are there um, so they'll, they'll sit there and be ready, but if you can keep them connected, that's, that's super valuable in that break. So whatever you want to do, if you just throw up pre-recorded videos, they'll figure that out pretty quick and they'll abandon. The second thing that we've seen people do in these pre, in these breaks is they'll do, um, have a, have a, a host, right? So they'll kind of do like you, like a sports halftime on a sporting event, right? They'll have a, have a couple people talking, they'll have them on camera, they'll set up a studio. Maybe there's a live crowd around them watching, right? as they talk and they'll broadcast that. And so then that will come in and they'll talk about, oh, the keynote and blah, 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 and have some analyst, which is probably the marketing director or whomever, right, at the event, at the company, um, talking about the, you know, what the executives just said. And so those kinds of things keep people connected to the event. They didn't leave during the break, right? Kept the event going. And then the second thing that it does is it's reinforcing the content because you're saying the content again, right? Repeating the key messages and that helps them retain it. Absolutely. And what you're getting at there is you've designed something for them, yeah. which is distinct and different from what the people in the room are getting to do. Yeah. So I've also thought like, how are you, you going to do a networking happy hour? Because I want to watch a bunch of people standing in line at the bar. No, it's not going to work, right? Right, right. It's a different and, kind of. What you might do though is, is you may cut that, and you may you have to decide. So when you're producing that schedule, you actually will have a schedule for the online event, and it might start five minutes before the doors open, right? And you'll have that host. Hi, I'm the host. Here's how you navigate the platform. Here's how you're going to do all the things you're going to do. Blah blah blah. Now let's go live into the room, right? And just like you see on TV, because that's your analogy, right? Is live television. So in the. Uh, NCAA tournament is on right now. It's a perfect place to look, right? They're flipping the great gumball. They're back to the game. They're doing their different things. Um, it's a good, if you, even if you just watch, what do they do in the introduction, the event, what do they do at halftime? And what do they do to wrap up? That's a great simple 
formula that you can apply to your hybrid events when they come along. Something that I hear a lot about, I just want to throw this in, yeah. and you all are going to get asked about it is sponsorship and um, trade show booths and exhibitors, right? People that pay all the money for these things. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of opportunities in those spaces to create sponsored content for the online, right? They're big logo, give them an interview slot to talk about their products and services. All of that can be done. Maybe the executive of that at, you know, whoever it is from that company is there at the beginning, you know, oh, we'd look, thank you for having us, you know, that kind of stuff you can do. So um, that's simple, but that's where you get your money. And that's for some of you that those dollars are going to be important to help you pay for the kind of production you need to do here. Awesome. We got two more questions, uh, but I want to go ahead and encourage people and Carol's watching the questions. If you guys have any questions for Sam, you know, throw them in the box uh, and we'll probably have time to take one or two right away and then maybe revisit some stuff at the end. Uh, but Sam, you know, no, no doubt COVID has led to some rapid technology advancements. You know, looking out, what are you most excited about in terms of engagement in the next year or in the next five years? Well, I think the, um, there's a couple, I mean, there's a couple things, right? So if you think about it from an exhibit, we work with a lot of exhibitors and they all felt like they didn't get their money's worth this last year, right? Because they went from like, hey, I had this big, huge island booth and now I got a Facebook page and it's not even a good one, right? And I paid all this money for it. And the guy with the 10 by 10 booth got the same one and he got more leads than me, right? Yep. These people are just, yep. go, our, our customers there are just going crazy. Um, so what I'm looking for is more value created, right? And a lot of these platforms, there's hundreds of them now. They didn't exist a year ago today, but now there's hundreds of them and they're gonna have to figure that out. And you, all of you out here want that because that's what you need to drive value. The second thing that I would like to see, and you start to see this, right? There's there's some new people coming out with little solutions for, for networking. How do I do virtual networking, right? So I'm looking, I'm looking to see more of that, right? Where are they gonna do some more things there? So I think that'll be important. Another thing that's gonna be really important for all of you is how do I merge my online and my event, right? Because I we're starting to hear from customers where they're like, hey, my event app does these things. My virtual app does these things, but they don't talk. Yeah. How do I have it? And we, since we do games, they ask us, how do I have a game? I can't do a game here and here. I need one that encompasses all of it, right? And yeah. so those, that bridge will be um, exciting to see how, how we all manage it. Um, but there, there are some simple strategies for if you're going to pull questions in and all that, that you can bring those into the room and those will be fine. Because what you're going to want to do is just as Carol has questions, she's ready to ask them you're gonna to wanna to have that in your live event because if you can bring up the five questions from the virtual audience and say those in the room, right? That's gonna be awesome. And um, those people are gonna love love hearing their name. Sorry. Feedback loop, we get a feedback loop and the audience is the audience. That's, right? it, that's really the most important thing, right? I do something and then I there's an action to it. And your executives, some executives get really antsy, right? About They're like, we don't want live polling and whatever because of I have to do stuff or whatever. <laughs> Don't, don't make it complicated, right? Keep it simple. Don't let, and if a vendor comes along and they're like, it's so complicated, to get them out, right? Find a new one. So keep it, keep it simple. Awesome. So then my, my final question, when you're not engaging an audience, how do you stay inspired? <laughs> um, well, so just like the rest of you, I've been at home for the last year and, um, and I got into gardening. So, um, my tulips are, I live in, uh, now I live in Cincinnati, Ohio. And so I have my daffodils started blooming a couple days ago. I have about 300 daffodils and my tulips are coming up and I planted 450 tulips last year and they're, they're coming up now. So like in a few weeks, right, I'm expecting to see this really cool, like whatever, you know, massive tulips and colors and all that. And it's kind of fun to see, right? So, because you, you know, I, I did a few and they were, they worked and I thought, oh, this is great. But I like the rest of you had all kinds of extra time on my hands. So now I have like the kooken off at my house. So we'll see. <laughs> oh, that's, that's awesome, Sam. I mean, funny, funny story. I did the same thing. I have 300 that I'm fighting some rabbits over. So I'm excited to see them start coming up here in Minnesota. Oh yeah. Yeah. And by the way, everyone who's doing this, you become Mr. McGregor all of a sudden and you're like, <laughs> after deer and rabbits and all kinds of things. And you're, cause you spent so much time and all of a sudden, now I know I, I used to not wonder, or I used to not understand Mr. McGregor and why I was so, so uh, against Peter Rabbit, but now I'm the same, I'm exactly that guy.
Oh, well, I love yeah. gardening just like you guys do. But before we leave this section, several people asked one theme. And I want to throw that out before we go into the last part of our program. And that is people are asking how they get music involved, live music or music other than just a dance party or playing music pre and post. What are some quick tips on music? Yeah, I, I'm going to be honest. I'm not that's not something that's in my territory. So it's not something I get involved with. Um, but here's, here's the thing that you want to remember, right? Are you asking them to participate in the music, right? So is this something you're asking them to participate in? Or if you're going to shoot music and shoot a band, remember, don't do one camera angle. You want to have multiple angles to create the, the impact. Um, I understand the dance party thing, right? That worked really well last through June, right? And then it kind of things changed. I mean, also, I'll tell you what we see a lot is that numbers really drop after four o'clock now, right? So, I mean, I know I'm not answering your music question, I apologize, but this four, the think about this part, after four, even though people are still at home and they will be until September, they are, they, they've got new routines that involve their evening. And so we see numbers way down after, you know, at that point. So keep that in mind for those of you who are, um, trying to plan those evening things, I would not worry about the virtual attendees at that point, send them home. Awesome, well, great. I mean, I learned so much in that brief period of time. Um, we're gonna run into a next section. Ryan and I have a couple of tips that we feel really drive uh, more meaningful engagement as well. So Ryan, why don't you kick it off? Thanks, Sam. Yeah, we wanted to spend some time and we're gonna reinforce sort of what some stuff you heard Sam say because you gotta hear something seven times for it to sink in. Uh, but we just had six tips we wanted to share with you guys to drive sort of more meaningful engagement um, as things you can and take away from this press, hopefully take away from this presentation uh, or have in the back of your mind as you're getting ready for sort of your upcoming event. You know, and the, and the first one for me uh, that's always important is that, you know, engagement needs to be on purpose. What's the reason for it? I think back in live events, you know, um, you, you did think we did things because we did things or because they were expected parts of a routine. A night, a night had to sort of, a gala event had a certain format. To that point, a dance party is how you ended an event, you're right, to the music question. Um, you know, and right now they're in the virtual space, there's a lot of gimmicks and a lot of games and a lot of giveaways, which can be temporarily gratifying. Uh, but fostering meaningful engagement during your event requires intention. And that was the intentions um, Sam was talking about, about offering things that really reinforce learning that give or that sort of uh, play to the fact of what the guest kind of wants, to, what the guest wants to do, you know? So when, when you hit the question of live music, I don't have a direct, well, trade it for trivia answer, but I have an answer that says, try to think about what the reason for the music was. What did the music achieve? Um, and if you can get to that sort of goal or that objective, you can maybe then start brainstorming the replacement or the alternative that, that achieves that sort of same objective. You know, when it comes to learning, you know, Events are the primary way in which we educate adults in the world. And now, now we're educating kids this way too. Um, but when it comes to adults, adult learning happens when folks are told what they're gonna do and why it's important. And when you're doing that, that's sort of the first step in building trust, which is a key component of sort of good participation. Uh, so like I said, there are three questions to kind of keep in the back of your head when it comes to, uh, uh, when it comes to that engagement. Like I just said, what's the reason or the purpose for that engagement? Is it about culture building? Uh, are you trying to uh, foster networking? Is it social engagement, um, which is sort of what a dance party may have, may have been? Or is it about reinforcing the learning? Second, you know, what do you need to get out of it? Oftentimes, I think that we throw games on to have games, or we throw activities in to events just to have them, to check a box. Uh, but if you're, gonna, if you're gonna ask somebody to take the time to participate, you, know, you should be getting something out of that. So are, are you, do you need metrics? Do you need something to show the boss or something to show the sponsor that, that uh, people paid attention? Are you looking for user-generated content? Are you trying to get people to participate in the conversation? Like we ask you to put comments in so that, you, so that we could make you part of the dialogue. You know, is it about sort of understanding who's in the group and building trust? That's really important if you're trying to foster a meeting that ha that needs to do collaboration or creativity. People have got to trust each other on the phone call. And, if the, and, and, and so engagements that are icebreakers, engagements that allow people to get to know each other, sort of like the gardening question. Like I, you know, who knew that Sam's, this engagement guy loved tulips, right? And that becomes a personalization note. Now all of a sudden we have a connection that's a little more human than just the facts. 
than just the, uh, just the distribution. But the third question, which to me is the most important, um, is why did they want to do it? You know, why does the person on the other side of the screen want to join in? Why do they want to click or play or comment or say? What is sort of in it for them? Uh, and to that point, it leads to our second, our second bullet, which is considering their motivations. Human beings are unique. They have different behavioral motivations, which are very, which are important to consider uh, when designing your virtual event and also your live event. So, virtual, live, or hybrid. This, this is a universal sort of thing. I hope more people do as we go forward. You know, and uh, like Sam called out, you know, when given a choice, people probably in the virtual space at least have something more interesting to do just to click away. So, if the programming isn't captivating. Uh, and the engagement is not intentional, the chances you're going to keep your eyeballs on the screen goes down um, with all distractions. A little bit of social theory. Um, so there's an organization, you know, Forrester Research came out with uh, something that they dubbed social technographics, which was really this um, thought back uh, in the early days of the internet about how people would participate online. But I think it's highly applicable to how we think about people uh, participating in virtual events. The, the idea being that there are sort of different motivations uh, within any general population or any group um, that uh, will foster how they want to choose to engage, you know? Uh, so some people are creators, they wanna make stuff. They wanna put ideas out there. They wanna enter, they're gonna enter comments in the box or enter questions uh, if given the choice. Some people are commenters, they wanna critique or engage in conversation. They might not put out the question, but they might reply to that question. Other people are joiners or collectors, much to the same point. The people who want to see their name on a leaderboard and, and sort of compete there, they're collecting points. Collection is what sort of motivates them, or they want to join a group uh, and feel a part of something. They're going to hop onto a team trivia opportunity potentially quite well. And some people just observe. You know, it, it's really important to remember, um, like Sam said, I think oftentimes the pressure from clients or the pressure from executives is to see big numbers, right? We want 100% participation, but that's kind of a false analogy because we, we think that 100% participation is 100% of the people logged in. That's not realistic, right? No one form of participation is more valuable than the other. Although in Western culture, we tend to value the more um, expressive or the more extroverted or sort of the verbal forms, but all forms are participation, even spectating or, or being inactive. You're still there listening. You're, you know, you might have a great idea from something in this presentation might give you a brilliant idea three days from now. We're never going to capture it in this hour. Likewise, if there are 100 people on this call right now, but only 10 people put in questions, does that mean we failed because 90% didn't? No, it doesn't. It just means that those 90% chose to participate in a different way. So our task is to be able to offer guests multiple opportunities to engage in the way that they feel most comfortable. It's designed for them and then be able to track those metrics to demonstrate our success. The last third, three points. Or, that was, so the third bullet, and then we'll hit you, Carol, uh, is one that we heard Sam talk about a lot in, in sort of his, in his comments and feedback, which is that, you know, if information distribution is about talking, participation is about listening. It requires interaction and it requires providing feedback. That's what the rest of the reciprocity principle is all about. You know, in my opinion, the primary function of engagement is inclusion. It's making me feel part of the event. You know, it, it functions to reflect me as an attendee back in a dialogue so that I can see myself as part of the action. You know, uh, to the point of, uh, to the example, I wanna hear my name called out. I wanna know that I'm part of this, even though I'm not there in person. Good participation requires acknowledgement of the guest and engagement happens when empathy is present. And when you do those two things, you build trust. And as you establish trust or a sense of community um, through the filter of the screen, this little snowball effect starts happening. And Sam was, Sam was sort of referring to it. You know, in, acknowledgement encourages participation, which is reflected back as acknowledgement again, and then we get more participation. And so it goes on and on and on. And that's how you sort of grow, grow good engagement in, in, in sort of an event. And whether we do that with a post or whether we do that or with a host or we do that with sort of poll questions or chat box, there are multiple avenues in, but the goal is we're constantly building a feedback loop with those people who are watching our show. Um, that was number three. So now Carol, take it off with number four. 
The last three are things that are things you do every day, relatively simple, but you must keep in mind. First and foremost, is your engagement mobile friendly? As mentioned before, people are watching these screens or listening to your program in various ways, but it's very stagnant on a screen. So they're looking at a cell phone, a laptop. They may not have a mouse or a keyboard. Maybe they're in their car. Obviously, the most important thing is what they're hearing. So you need to make sure they can hear it well. You're not speaking too quickly. But also, are you keeping it in short segments? Are you breaking it up with really good graphics? Remember mobile friendly, because you always use those resources when you were at a live event, when you were presenting on stage. Next is accessibility. Remember special needs, hearing impaired, visual impaired. What if they're having internet connection problems? Make sure that you share with your attendees and your speakers and anyone presenting all of the technology tools, troubleshooting, how to communicate, explain the chat box, explain where to put the questions, make sure that there's control on the mutes. Everybody gets the, the system. Remember when we first got it started and anybody could talk and we were having our events bombed by people that weren't supposed to be there? Well, we learned. There's so much more we can learn about accessibility, but remember, engagement is by accessibility. So keep that in mind. Time zones, think about those things. Last but not least is sustainability. Prior to everything going south, we were all getting into and really becoming aware of the environmental footprint of our events and how it was affecting the convention centers, the hotels, the restaurants. Well, when we started being at home, the first way we thought we connect, could, could connect was by sending out a box in advance or sending something to our guests. Well, go back to thinking about that environmental footprint. Are we making good choices, especially in our industry about how we are connecting with our guests? Are we sending things that they really need that relate to our content and engage them? And are they things that are sustainable for the future? You know, maybe you're sending seeds or talking about plants or whatever it is, don't forget that we started down this path and we were doing really well. We don't wanna go backwards and start sending things out that aren't considering our footprint again. I think now um, we are ready for Gwen to join us and throw out some questions. <laughs> I am here. Uh, so the first question is from Debbie and um, it was, uh, <clears throat> Is, is it the planners or, or producers that are missing the mark or is it the clients who don't understand the value of engagement layers? Tricky, chicken and egg? <laughs> Carol, do you wanna take a stab? Well, I don't think anybody's missing the mark. I think we're learning and evolving. Hmm. I don't think when this started, any of us thought we would be doing this for so long. And like I said before, and like Sam mentioned and Ryan, we have gone a hundred miles from where we started. So I don't think anybody's missing the mark. I think this is a very, very fluid and liquid tool that we're all learning. Just like there's so many platforms every day, there's a new platform, a new program, a new widget. Stay creative, stay open to ideas. I think everybody's learning and I think we're gonna be a lot better when we get to the end of the, the road on this. Ryan, Sam? I saw Sam jump in there. So what were you gonna say? Hi. Um, you know, I, I think that the number one thing that's happened this year versus 10 years ago or five years ago, three years ago, is that event planners became attendees and got to have the attendee experience. And as more people got the attendee experience, that's where you understood the boundaries and what success can look like. Um, and creativity, right? I feel like there's lots, many new ideas. Many of the people on this call, I was reading the chat, have lots of other ideas that we don't have. And I think that's great because that innovation um, is successful. But that's like Carol said, it's a learning opportunity, but starts from being an attendee. Yeah, I would, I would second, I would second both of those. That you know, this this is about learning, and so it's about eyes open rather than eyes closed and just waiting for life to come back, right? you got to jump in, you got to learn, you got to observe, and you got to participate. Um, and you, you do know what works and what doesn't work. I mean, the educational need is, is, I guess, the onus for education, I think, is on both sides. The planner producer has got to be educated in what's possible, and, and the client's got to be willing to learn what it takes. 
Um, I, I think in the last year, a lot of it was about, I just have to get through. Um, and now it's going to be about, well, I got to make this good. I got to make this, this meaningful because it's going to be around for a while and it's going to stick. Um, and uh, so that's the opportunity or that's the potential. So our next question is from Jillian. It's, uh, it's kind of a tips question. Um, do you have any recommendations for fundraising galas? So I guess, you know, in terms of interactive ideas. Me. You. <laughs> Hi, so we work with a lot of fundraising galas and they're doing lots of different things. Now, most of the people call us for games. So I'm gonna have a little bias towards that, but here's what I want you to think about. So you wanna create a shared experience, right? So that's your goal. So find an activity that can create the shared experience. So here's what I've heard from our different clients in fundraising. One, so people are doing, so we do lots of trivia, live trivia. So they're doing live trivia. And then what they're doing is they're raising money by having people pay to join. They're buying teams or they're paying as individuals. They're having people sponsor. They had worked with um, boy, uh, uh, big brothers, big sisters in in Arkansas, and what they did is they actually sold to their sponsors instead of having a big gala. They had a sponsor with a focused activities and created shared experiences to all of them. So they had miniature events which they could do with more focused groups. So they actually had several and raised a ton of money that way, corporate dollars, right? Not just individual donor dollars. Um, we see a lot of people. If you're from St. Louis, the St. Louis people out there, I guess, are really big into trivia. So they like. So they'll do things like, hey, buy a mulligan. So, oh, you didn't get that right? Ah. <laughs> hit bid pal, hit bid pal and buy some points, right? So they're, they're raising money doing that, right? Um, you also see, uh, so in addition to, hey, you paid to get in. And by the way, I heard it's 250 bucks down there in St. Louis, which is pretty crazy. Cause you know, we talked to people and they're like 20 bucks sounds like a lot. And then St. Louis people are like, eh, 250, whatever. So, um, Per team, right? That's crazy. So you, you see that. You also see corporate dollars with this um, mulligan. And um, we also see people buying per game. So they'll do things like that. So if you think about like, like, all right, so what, it doesn't have to be trivia, but what trivia is doing in those groups is it's creating that shared experience. And so that's what's different. So there's other things that can do that, but you'll just have to find what those are. So that uh, raising money. The other thing that I we see, see and hear about is that these, these uh, gala people are taking the dot, um, there to make it why today, right? Because the shared experience says, why do I have to do it right now at seven o'clock versus why can't I just watch this on Wednesday, right? So, but they're also doing things where they're saying, hey, you're gonna have at your house kind of your own hybrid event, whoever your small pod is of people. So they're actually saying when you buy, we're also bringing a meal to you and it's for eight or four or whatever. And so people will do the meal. So they'll eat and then they're doing this shared experience all at the same time. So we'll see that. Is that cool? Yeah, it's great. Um, so the next question comes from Sarah. Uh, what are your recommendations for offering inactivity or interactivity and engagement for events with an attendee event over a thousand? Okay, so, and this is for me again or for Ryan? It can be for any of you, but go ahead. <laughs> hey, Ryan, can you put the ladder up again? Mm -hmm. So this is a key, this is your, so if you have a thousand, so you probably have multiple groups, multiple breakouts, you're gonna be doing lots of things. So a couple of things that, that you wanna think about is, is what is creating some kind of layered engagement, okay? So this is where your layers come in. So your creators are gonna create stuff, but some people are just gonna hit like, I, sub, you know, I agree, right? They just wanna hit like a button, like, yeah, thumbs up or vote, vote in the poll or whatever it is. Um, so you want to think about these different layers because people aren't going to be motivated to participate in the same way. So like if when we do a game, not everyone's going to win on the leaderboard with a thousand, right? Only the top 50 people care. What, what about the 51 through 999, right? Some of them are inactive, so they won't play. So you're really through 800 maybe. So you have to have another type of reward system for them. So you want to, this is why the layering, layering comes in is to think about other kinds of motivational rewards you can create for people to get them engaged. So when, when we, one, at once upon a time, Ryan and I designed a couple of events together. And, and in that process, we looked, we used this tool in a physical event for how do you create these different experiences because attendees are gonna have different paths 
And if you use this ladder uh, as a guide for that, you can create different kinds of engagement experiences for those attendees. We, we, did a, um, we have a client in Australia that just did an event for um, the shoe company Foot Locker, if you guys have ever heard of Foot Locker in Australia. And what they did is after they had the big like, hey, the CEO is, you know, we're going, we're all going right. We were going left, now we're going right. And I don't really know what that means in Foot Locker. Maybe it means instead of selling these shoes, we're going to sell those shoes, but it's not, the details aren't important. But what they did after that big session is they sent everyone into breakouts, right? And so they had organized it so they knew which groups of smaller groups were going to go into what breakout so that you only saw the breakout you were supposed to go to. And so then they had a conversation about it. In a, it was, they were opening up a Zoom call, but they had everyone divided up so that they could talk about what they had just heard and create meaning from that. Those kinds of things, that's a layering a technique, right? That's also something you can do in a big group, right? Make it feel intimate. But also, the, as Ryan has said, the people that and adult learning, right? The more you hear the message, the more they talk about it. Some people need to verbalize it. The more they verbalize it, that helps reinforce the message. Yeah, much, much to that point, to second sort of what Sam is getting at, you know, I, I often talk about this as you're building a menu approach to your program. Uh, and it's thinking about, you know, yes, the work is a little harder on the planner because you need to design and engineer multiple tracks of experience that not everybody's going to participate in. And actually that's okay. The more you can sort of bring personalization to the table, the more you can let people choose their own happy meal, because it's all about what's going to make them happy. Um, the more they're going to talk to each other about what they got to do and what they got to see. And it's okay then when guests get to do different things, because it sort of then again drives conversation among themselves. But yeah, so much to Sam's point is designing multiple layers or multiple levels of ways to engage and participate and acknowledging it's okay that not everybody does everything, um, but that they can gravitate to the things that they're interested in doing because you'd rather have someone give you a, a score of 10 because on 30 minutes that they really loved than a score of two on three and a half hours you forced them to watch. Yeah. Yeah. So the next question comes from Will. Uh, any advice for better engagement during a long <laughs> he says, awards event or uh, for remote engagement? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think, um, rethink it. Why is it long? Is it long because it always was long? Because it wasn't a ballroom and it was dinner? We recently proposed to a client uh, a, a program where the awards, um, they, they had virtual, they were having a virtual sales meeting. It went into three nights. The awards were five minute commercial breaks in between content. Gave you chances to do little sort of transactional videos that were sort of in between. So you got peer to peer recognition and you got, um, and you sort of broke up the program because there wasn't a forced dinner anymore, right? Um, when it comes to awards, what do people want? People want, they want the recognition in front of their peers. So having an opportunity or an application on the side that allows for peer-to-peer -peer congratulation is really, really great. Um, and they want the acknowledgement from the executives, but it doesn't have to be all in one three-hour setting by any stretch of imagination. And the brilliant thing about virtual, one of the brilliant things about virtual is that opportunity, as Sam alluded to, it doesn't have to be right now in the same three hours. Right? Like we're so used in live events about thinking that the event is the thing. The reality of today, event planners are gonna be asked to become marketers. Registration is the new attendance. Once they register for the event, what are the things you're doing to engage them up till the actual event and beyond the event? That's the opportunity to make it even more meaningful. So, I mean, you could sprinkle awards all the way up to the Bay in conference or over the course of time after, you know? There's really great chances to break it up if we can get out of the mindset that it has to be three hours. And that's also the opportunity to use your website and get your marketing and your sales team involved because you can take segments and then put them on your website and have them for later viewing and other opportunities, just like these sessions are available later uh, to our members. So you're not restricted to this hour, it, it goes on. It just, I mean, I want to build on the, that point. So um, two, two things, you guys all probably watched the Grammys, right? I thought that was a really effective, really good, moved really fast because we didn't have to wait for them to talk in the crowd and go up on stage, right? Yeah. Um, remember you have that opportunity to cut out a lot of time. The other thing that I've seen is that also they have, when they have the award ceremony, they'll have the the nominees gather with their family 
and give them instructions on how to put the camera so they're with their family, you know, in the room. And if they're announced, they'll turn the spotlight on them and give them that chance to rec be recognized. That that little detail is kind of cool for everyone, especially since people haven't been getting together. Right. So. I'm going to jump on one more point with that Grammys because I, I agree, Sam. I think the Grammys did a really great job this year, and it's sort of pivoting to something that was awesome. virtual. One of the design things I thought was so brilliant that I think we can leverage in our events is that they perpetually upped the game as the night went on. So they used a little bit of a theater trick. When you came in at the first ebb, the camera spun around the room 360 degrees. You saw four small stages and you saw three performances. As that night progressed, all of a sudden those stages disappeared and they got bigger and they got bigger and they got louder and they never repeated something. So they were never back on the stage again. Like you, you didn't have people on the same stage performing the same way. Each stage was a new stage and it was bigger and it was lit differently and it was larger and it was turned and it was a different camera angle. Now we're on the roof. Now we're outside. They were perpetually keep, keeping the surprise going and that sort of ability to build. You know, one of the things that makes award shows miserable is really after award two, you know what's going to happen for the next 37 and 85% of the people in the crowd don't care, right? So how, can, how could you turn it up so that, each, so that as you, you give awards differently over time, whether that's to break them up or whether that's just to change the format. Um, and and that, engage, that, that bringing in of the family is also super successful. So I think that's gonna have to be the last question. I know you wanted to do um, a wrap up. So I'm gonna hand it back over to you, Ryan. Well, I'm gonna grab it real quick and just oh. say we've covered a lot of this. Thanks, <laughs> Grant. thank you so much. Um, we've covered a lot of territory, but we just wanna bring up three key must-haves for a meaningful attendee engagement. And first and foremost in this review, are you producing a good virtual event? You have heard a ton of ideas and thoughts today. You do amazing live events. This is just extending your talents and adding your creativity to engage in a virtual way and to remember technology and the content that your attendees are looking for that runs right into strategic thinking it's more important than ever. Content and interaction must be strategic and intentional. There's nothing left to chance. We don't have, as Ryan said, the ability to pick up and key on each other as we have in the past. It's all about the attendee experience and you need to make sure that you're providing content that they're looking for and sharing it in an engaging, fun and immersive way. I want to thank you for my time today. Brian, it's back to you. Yeah, and uh, it's just a second, that one. You know, it is all about the user experience and the ability to offer. I think if you heard Sam say, Carol say, and I say, if you take one thing away, offer a diversity of opportunity for guests to gravitate to the things that they're interested in, make it inclusive, make it accessible, make it device friendly, and make it good for the planet. Uh, and we, it will, that will take us a long way. Um, and, and a big part, we said from the start, was reciprocity. So, you know, about those drinks that we were talking about, to end our show, I would love to throw you, have you guys put in the chat box, how many beverages were in this presentation? And we'll have Carol keep watching to see what people say. We're trying to see that now. We're getting 14, 23 from Stephanie. Who else is putting in a number? 23 from Bobby, 16 from Stephanie. Uh, so let's see, 8, 22, Anne says 25. Oh, Anne, you are close, 26. Woohoo! Average has appeared in this presentation. Notice that was a trick. Carol mentioned it at the very start. Think about the ability to hide things in presentations to help keep eyeballs on screens while people are listening. You can, you can apply that to any sort of virtual presentation uh, as another technique to get some people to pay attention. Um, with that, thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, we wish we were all raising a glass uh, together. Um, and big thanks to Sam for being able to jump in and join in today. Really great points you had to make. Um, and I'm sure any of us are available to answer more questions. Just shoot us an email. I think they were in the original things and Sam's was up on the screen. Uh, but we'd love to talk more. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks everybody. We'll see you next time.